You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. This is Lecture 10 of the Lecture Cycle Practical Advice to Teachers given by Rudolf Steiner. This was dated September 1st, 1919. Let us try to proceed with our treatment of teaching methods by keeping one eye on the curriculum and the other on what will be the actual educational content within it. The curriculum will not contain all subjects at first, for we shall build up the way we view things by degrees. Footnote C. Steiner's Lectures on Curriculum and Discussions with Teachers. End footnote. I started by giving you considerations that allowed us to find characteristics belonging to the various stages of teaching. How many such stages can be distinguished from the beginning of school until the ages of 14 or 15? We have seen that an important turning point occurs at about age 10. We can say that the first stage of schooling lasts until the ninth year. What do we do during that period of time? Our starting point will be the artistic realm. We shall work musically and in painting and drawing with the children in the way we have discussed. We shall allow writing to proceed gradually out of painting and drawing. Step by step the forms of writing will arise out of the forms of our drawings, and then we shall move on to reading. It is important for you to understand the reasons for this sequence, so that you do not start with reading and then link it with writing, but rather progress from writing to reading. Writing is, in a sense, more alive than reading. Reading isolates human beings very much and draws them away from the world. In writing we have not yet ceased to imitate universal forms if we let it arise out of drawing. Printed letters have indeed become extraordinarily abstract, but they are derived from written letters and so we too let them arise from the written letters of our lessons. It is entirely right if at least for writing lessons you keep the thread intact that leads from the drawn shape to the written letter, so that the children still sense the original drawn form in the letters. In this way you overcome what is so alien to the world in writing. In the process of finding their way into writing, the children assimilate an element that is very alien to the world. But when we link the written shapes to the universal forms, when we say, for example, that F stands for fish and so on, we lead them back toward the world and it is so very important that we do not sever the children's links with the world. As we go farther back in civilization, the links we find that bind the human being to the world become more alive. You need only look with your souls at one particular image to understand what I mean. Instead of seeing me here talking to you, imagine that you are in ancient Greece, where a rhapsodist is reciting Homer to an audience in that strange style we no longer use, part song, part speech. Imagine a stenographer sitting by the side of this rhapsodist reciting Homer. What a strange scene, completely impossible. Impossible if only for the simple reason that the ancient Greeks had a very different memory and did not need anything so far removed from the world as the shapes of shorthand to remember what came to them through speech. You can see from this that an exceedingly destructive element constantly interferes in our culture. We need this destructive element. In the whole of our cultural life we cannot possibly do without shorthand, but we should be aware that there is something destructive in it. What in our cultural life is this awful habit of writing everything down in shorthand? It is as though we were no longer able to regulate our appropriate rhythm between waking and sleeping and were to use our sleep time to carry on all kinds of activities so as to implant in our soul life something that it no longer takes in naturally. By using shorthand we retain something in our culture that if left to ourselves with our present natural aptitudes we would cease to notice and in fact forget. We thus keep something artificially awake in our culture that destroys it just as much as all night studying ruins the health of overzealous students. For this reason our culture is no longer truly healthy. We must realize that we have already crossed the Rubicon. That was in ancient Greek times. Humankind has passed the point where we had an absolutely healthy culture. Now our culture will become ever more unhealthy, and human beings will more and more have to find within education a healing process against all the things that make them sick in their environment. 
We must not allow ourselves to indulge in illusions about this. For this reason it is infinitely important to connect writing with drawing and to teach writing before reading. Somewhat later we bring in arithmetic. Since there is no exact point in the development of the child when it is essential to begin arithmetic, we can fit it in among the other subjects. We can start later with arithmetic arithmetic, and build its fundamentals into the curriculum later. But we start in the way I have described. At the first stage, the curriculum will always include foreign language lessons, because from a cultural point of view they are necessary. For children of this age group, foreign language lessons must involve only learning to speak that language. Once children have reached the second stage, from ages 10 to about 13, we begin to develop increased self-awareness in in them through grammar. Through the change the children have experienced, as I described it here, they are now able to take in what can grow out of grammar. At this time we deal principally with word inflections. Then we make a start with the natural history of the animal kingdom in the way I outlined with the cuttlefish, mouse, and human being. Later we follow with the plant kingdom, as you will demonstrate to me this afternoon. Footnote, see discussion 10 in Discussions with Teachers. End footnote. During this stage of the child's development, we can also move on to geometry. Before this stage, all that we later teach as geometry is contained within drawing. With drawing, we can elaborate the triangle, the square, the circle, and the line for the child. The forms are developed through drawing. We draw them and then say, quote, this is a triangle and this is a square, unquote. But the element of geometry that is added, not before the ninth year, is the search for the relationships between forms. Foreign languages continue as well and the more grammatical side of language is introduced. Finally, we introduce the children to physics. At the third stage, leading up to ages 15 and 16, we start to teach syntax. Children are really ready to study syntax only at about 12 years of age. Before that age, we treat it in an instinctive way. Excuse me, read that again. Before that age, we treat in an instinctive way what can lead the children to the forming of sentences. The time has also come when we can study the mineral kingdom using the forms of geometry. We discuss the mineral kingdom by always linking it to physics, which we also apply to the human being as I have illustrated in the refraction of light through the lens in the eye. We introduce both physics and chemistry, and we also make a start on history. We can enrich the study of geography with natural history by using physics to link them and with geometry through the drawing of maps. Finally, we show its connections to history, that is, how the different peoples have developed their characters. These studies are conducted during the whole of these two stages in child development. Foreign languages continue and can now be extended to include syntax. Naturally, a number of issues will have to be taken carefully into consideration. We cannot study music with the little children when there are other children in the same classroom who need absolute quiet because they are supposed to be learning a lesson. Instead, we must paint and draw with the little ones in the morning and study music in the afternoon. In other words, we will allocate the available space in the school so that one subject does not disturb another. We cannot expect poems to be recited or a history lesson to be conducted when the little children in the next room are playing horns. These two are matters that are linked with the structure of the curriculum, and in establishing our school we have to carefully determine which subjects should be taken up in the morning and which in the afternoon. Now that we know the three stages of the curriculum, we see that we can determine the aptitudes of the children. We have to compromise, but for the moment let, us, let me assume that our situation is ideal. Later I will look at the curriculum of modern schools so that we can strike an adequate compromise. It is ideal to have a less sharp differentiation between the classes within each stage of development than between the stages themselves. We will imagine that a uniform progression through the school years can take place only between the first and second and between the second and third stages. We will discover that the so-called less gifted children usually take longer to understand. In each year's age group, at the first stage, there will be more capable students who grasp things sooner and digest them later, and less gifted students who have difficulties at first, but in the end also understand. 
We shall certainly experience this phenomenon, and for this reason we should refrain from making premature judgments as to which children are particularly gifted and which are less so. I have stressed before that we will be teaching children who have already attended a variety of classes elsewhere. Dealing with them will be all the more difficult the older they are. To a great degree we will be able to remould what has been spoiled in them if only we make sufficient effort. After introducing foreign languages to the children, Latin, French, English, Greek, as I have summarized, we should lose no time in starting to engage in an activity the children enjoy most of all. We must let them carry on conversations together in the appropriate language, while the teacher does no more than guide the process. You will find that they take tremendous delight in conversing together in a foreign language, while the teacher does nothing except make corrections or, or at most guide the conversation. If one of them says particularly boring things, for instance, the student could be diverted to a more interesting topic. The teacher's presence of mind will have to serve particularly well here. You must really experience the children before you as a choir that you will conduct. Let me read that again. You, you must really experience the children before you as a choir that you will conduct, though of course this must be done inwardly and not as an orchestra conductor. Then you must also ascertain which poems and other recitation pieces the children have been taught previously and what they remember, so that you can draw these poems from their memories like a treasure. To this treasure they have stored in their memories you link whatever grammar and syntax they still need to learn. It is extremely important that the children should retain what they have in their memories in the way of poems and so on, and that they connect to them the rules of grammar and syntax they need to master later. I have said already that it is not beneficial when their memories are ill-treated through writing out the sentences used in grammar lessons in order to learn rules. These sentences must be forgotten, but what is learned through the sentences must be coupled with what the children have stored in their memories. In this way what is retained in their memories will help them gain an increasing command of the language. If later on they want to write a letter or talk to someone in that language, they should be able to call to mind rapidly the appropriate turns of phrase they have mastered in this way. Taking such things into account is part of the economy of teaching. When teaching foreign languages, you have to know what hinders progress. If you read a passage aloud to your class while they follow the text in their books, it is nothing but time eliminated from their lives. It is the worst thing you could possibly do. The right way is for the teacher to relate freely whatever is to be put across to the children, or, if a passage or poem is presented verbatim, to speak it by heart without using a book. Meanwhile, the students do nothing but listen. They do not read the text as the teacher speaks. Then possibly they are asked to reproduce what they have heard without reading it first. This method is vital for teaching foreign languages, but need not be taken into account so much for lessons in the mother tongue. What matters very much with the foreign language is that the children should understand through hearing rather than through reading that a language should become intelligible to them through speech. When this has been accomplished, the children can be allowed to take their books and read the passage. Alternatively, if this is not expecting too much of them, they can be given for homework the task of reading what has been addressed in the lesson. In foreign languages, homework should be restricted mainly to reading. Any written work should really be done at school. As little homework as possible should be given and not until the later stages, after the age of twelve. Even then it should deal only with the affairs of real life, such as writing letters, business correspondence, and so on. It is real malpractice in a higher sense to have school children write essays in foreign languages on subjects that have nothing to do with life. We should be content with letter writing, business correspondence, and similar topics. We can go beyond these subjects at most by letting the children recount events that have happened to them, things that they have experienced. Up to the age of fourteen, such narration of real happenings should be cultivated far more than free composition. Free composition really has no place in school before the ages of fourteen or fifteen. What does belong in school up to that point is the narrative retelling of what the children have experienced and heard. They must learn to take these experiences in, for otherwise they cannot participate in an appropriately social way in the cultural process of humanity. Indeed, educated people today <clears throat> generally notice only half the world and not the whole of it. <clears throat> people do many experiments today, particularly in the field of criminal psychology. Everything has to be proved by experiment these days. 
Let me give you an example. A lecture is announced. These are academic experiments carried out at universities. For the purpose of the experiment, the lecturer plans the sequence of events beforehand with one of the students. The professor mounts the platform and speaks the first words of the lecture. All this is written down in great detail. At that moment, the student who is part of the plot leaps onto the platform and tears down the coat the professor has hung on a hook there. He does exactly what they have prearranged. The professor behaves accordingly and makes a rush at the student to prevent him from taking down the coat. All the actions are predetermined. They wrestle, making the movements they have contrived beforehand. They have studied it in detail and learned it by heart so that they do everything exactly as arranged. Then the audience members, who are not in the know, will behave in some way. This cannot be predetermined. But perhaps the plot could include someone whose task it is to carefully observe the behavior of the audience. Finally, at the end of the experiment, the members of the audience are asked to write down what they have seen. Such experiments have been conducted at universities, including the very experiment I have just described. The result was that from an audience of about thirty people, at most four or five, related the scene correctly. This can be verified because every action was prearranged and the scene was enacted accordingly. Barely one-tenth of the audience recorded the scene accurately. Most people write down the most absurd things when taken by surprise in this way. Since we are so fond of experimenting today, we conduct this kind of investigation and then scientifically reach the significant conclusion that witnesses in court are unreliable. If only one-tenth of an educated audience in, an, in a university lecture hall, they are all educated people, are they not, report a sequence of events correctly, while the others report incorrectly, and some even put down utter nonsense, how can witnesses in court be expected to give accurate accounts about events they saw weeks or perhaps months earlier? People with sound common sense certainly know this to be true, because in the course of ordinary life, people nearly always incorrectly relate what they have seen or heard. All you can do is develop a fine nose for detecting whether someone is being told to you, whether something is being told to you accurately or not. Of all the things people tell you from every side, hardly one-tenth is, strictly speaking, true. Hardly one-tenth is a correct account of an actual event. As a matter of fact, people do things by halves. They develop the half that they could more easily do without if they were to rely properly on sound common sense. It is the other half that is more important. We ought to see to it that our cultural life develops in a way that will mean that witnesses are more reliable and people tell more of the truth. But to achieve this end, we should start to work on it in childhood. That is the reason why it is essential to let children recount what they have been, what they have seen and experienced, rather than expect them to write free compositions. In this way, we will inculcate in them the habit of telling in life, and perhaps also in court, not something that they have invented, but whatever is the truth regarding the external facts discerned by their senses. The will realm ought to be taken more into account in this effort than the intellectual realm. The purpose of that experiment of the prearranged scene enacted in the lecture hall and the statements made by the audience was to find out how many people excuse me was to find out how many lies people tell. In an intellectual age like ours this is understandable, but we must bring our intellectual age back to the realm of the will. We must pay attention to educational details such as letting the children, once they can write, and particularly after their twelfth year, recount events that have actually happened rather than cultivating free composition, which has no place in education before the age of fourteen or fifteen. In foreign, in foreign language lessons it is essential to bring our students gradually to the point at which they are able to retell briefly something they have seen or heard. It is also important to cultivate the element of reflex action in connection with language, that is, to give the children orders, do this, do that, and make sure they carry them out. In this exercise, what the teacher says is not followed by reflection on what has been said or by a slowly spoken answer, but by action. In this way, the will realm, the element of movement, is cultivated in language lessons. These are the ideas that you must ponder well and absorb, and take into account particularly in foreign language lessons. Our task is always to unite the will realm with the intellect in the right way. It is also important to cultivate object lessons in our school, but without allowing them to become banal. The children should never have the feeling that what they are, told, are being told in an object lesson is really rather obvious. Quote, here is a piece of chalk. 
What color is it? Unquote, quote, yellow. Unquote. Quote, what is it like at the top? Unquote. Quote, it is broken off. Unquote. Many an object lesson is given along these lines. It is atrocious. Something that is obvious in ordinary life should not be used as an object lesson. Such lessons should be lifted up to a higher level. When they are being given an object lesson, the children should be transported by it to a higher sphere of their soul life. You can achieve this aim particularly well if you combine object lessons with geometry. Geometry offers an extremely good example of how to link the object lesson to the subject itself. You start, for instance, by drawing a right-angled isosceles triangle for the children. Below it, you attach a square to the triangle. Now we have a right-angled isosceles triangle with a square attached to it. If you have not already done so, you teach the children that with an isosceles triangle, the sides, A and B, are the two that contain the right angle, and that side, C, is the hypotenuse. On the hypotenuse, you have constructed a square. This example refers only to an isosceles triangle. Then you divide the square with diagonal lines, coloring one part red, top and bottom, and one part yellow, right. Now you say to the children, I'm going to cut out the yellow part and place it beside my drawing. Then you take the red part and attach it to the yellow part. Now you have made a square to fit one of the two equal sides, but it is constructed of a red piece and a yellow piece. Thus the second drawing is the same size as the yellow and red portions in the first drawing and amounts to half of the square on the hypotenuse. Then you do the same for the other of the two equal sides using blue and adding the blue piece at the bottom so that once again so that once more you have a right angled isosceles triangle. Again you cut it out so that now you have a square on the other of the two sides. Schopenhauer used to be furious in his day because the the theorem of Pythagoras was not taught in this way. In his book, The World as Will and Idea, he expressed this feeling in his rather coarse manner, quote, how stupid schools are not to teach the Pythagorean theorem by simply placing one part on top of another so that the children can see a concrete demonstration of it, unquote. This applies to isosceles triangles, but exactly the same can be done with scalene right-angled triangles by fitting one part over another in the manner demonstrated. That is an object lesson. You can turn geometry into an object lesson. When you aim to teach the children the Pythagorean theorem after the age of ten, it is vital that you plan ahead how you will demonstrate it for them by fitting together the parts of the square on the hypotenuse. I have often tested this myself. If you, as the teacher, have in mind that you are aiming to teach this in a particular geometry lesson, in at most seven or eight preceding lessons, you can teach all the geometry that is necessary to lead up to the Pythagorean theorem, the, the well-known, quote, asses bridge, unquote. It is very economical indeed to teach the beginnings of geometry in this graphic manner. You will save much time and you will also rescue the children from a significant pitfall, something that is destructive to teaching. You spare them from carrying out abstract thinking in the effort to understand the Pythagorean theorem. You let them form concrete thoughts and proceed from the simple to the complex. You should start by formulating the Pythagorean theorem as shown here for the isosceles triangle and then you progress to the scalene triangle. Even when this lesson is taught today in the manner of an object lesson, for it does happen sometimes, it is not broad enough to cover the whole of the Pythagorean theorem. People do not begin with the simple isosceles triangle, which is a good preparation, and progress to the scaling right-angled triangle, but this is the very point that is important, to include it very consciously in the goal of geometry lessons. What you must consider is the use of different colors. The various areas are treated with colors that are laid one on top of the other, most of you will have done something similar already, though not quite in the same way. Outline up to the ni- number one. Up to the ninth year, music, painting, drawing, writing, reading, foreign languages, arithmetic somewhat later. Number two, up to the twelfth year, geography continually from this point on, grammar and, world in- and word inflections, natural history of animal kingdom and plant kingdom, Foreign Languages, Geometry, Concepts of Physics, Part 3, up to the 14th year. Geography continues, Syntax, Minerals, Physics and Chemistry, Foreign Languages, History. The end of Lecture 10.